<clears throat> okay, so uh, today we'll talk about uh, an important uh, British uh, architect who died in 2001, Sir Dennis Lusden. Uh, and uh, we'll uh, review some of his most important works. Let's read a little bit about him. So Sir Dennis Louis Lusden was born on se in September to 1914. <clears throat> but died on the 11th of January, 2001. So uh, 21 years ago, exactly on this day, uh, January 11th, was an eminent English architect, the son of Nathan Lusden and Julie, not anyway. Probably his best known work is the Royal National Theatre on London's South Bank of the Thames, which is a grade two listed building and one of the most notable examples of brutalist design in, in the United Kingdom. Now, brutalism uh, came back to fashion in a way a few years ago. I saw um, in Vienna, there was an exhibition, uh, SOS uh, uh, Brutalismus. Um, there was a big uh, book published about it. And I think uh, brutalist architecture or what is called brutalist architecture uh, became somehow uh, of interest to us because uh, after a while, perhaps we became tired of the, you know, uh, minimalist uh, the pretentiousness and uh, pedantic uh, aesthetic um, that uh, it promoted. Also, maybe in reaction to a certain, uh, you know, uh, white fragilization that came via certain uh, Japanese stars like uh, Kazuyo Sejima, uh, to an extent maybe even Toyo Ito, even more so Ishigami and so on. Uh, so um, brutalism uh, is, uh, is uh, you can count on it in terms of, uh, you know, uh, abrupt, uh, abrupt, uh, um, you know, uh, presence, so to speak, and and then solidity, and uh, it, it has some virtues, but some people consider it uh, indeed as being brutal. Although, in my opinion, behind the brutalist appearance, sometimes hides a sensitive creator or author. So let's see what Dennis Lasden was and is about. Lasden studied, of course, at the Architectural Association in London, this school which never tired of producing remarkable architects and was a junior in the practice of Welsh codes. Like other modernist architects, <coughs> including Sir Basil Spence and Peter and Alison Smithson, Lasden was much influenced by Le Corbusier and Ludwig Miss van der Rohe, uh, but there was a gentler, more classical influence too from the likes of Nicholas Hosmore. Lasden was elected a Royal Academician on the 29th of May, 1991. Uh, so let's move forward. Here was the man, uh, indeed an interesting man and with some, uh, skepticism, a little bit surprising, I would say, from a, from a genuine cert. Uh, you see his expression on his face, you know, rather inquisitive. Um, and, uh, you know, looking at this gentleman, you wouldn't expect him to be a, you know, a, a brutalist. <laughs> but uh, I don't think his work is truly so brutal at all. Uh, or, or look here, you know, how could this man be a brutalist? <laughs> look at look at his face. I, 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 I don't think it's possible. Anyway, nor here. He looks almost like, a, you know, a meditative, a melancholy man, you know, uh, almost an existentialist. The Hallfield Primary School in Paddington from 1952, um uh, well i hope i have better pictures but even uh, from this picture we can see clearly skill you know and uh, clear cut skill so to speak it's it, it's uh, it's easy to comprehend the building somehow looking from here 
and uh, you see that this architect had uh, you know a clear vision so to speak he was uh, but but he also indulged in uh, you know modifying uh, the trajectory of the walls um, you know in a in a fluid way when uh, when necessary in 1952, but when you think that it's just seven years after the deadly Second World War, indeed, it, it, it is a modernity here, which is, uh, uh, you know, obvious, and it's certainly not brutal. I mean, this uh, canopy, okay, maybe it's a little bit dramatic, but I wouldn't call it uh, brutal or brutalist. The Killing House. Grade two listed, the first example of post-war council housing to gain this distinction. So the killing house, killing not K-I-L-L-I-N-G, but uh, K-E-E-L-I-N-G, um, you know, a block of flats. Um, look at the cars, the, the vehicles on the road, on the, on the street, and the building, you know, it's, it's like the it's like the cars were made with uh, at least 30 40 50 years earlier than the building you know the the building could have been made today but not the cars so this is like in the drawings of uh, and the renderings of le corbusier or sketches he envisioned an architecture which could have been built uh, you know in the present but he didn't modify the design of the cars. The cars on his uh, highways, triumphant or not, on the roads, are the cars of his time. While the architecture could have been the architecture of our time. So, but we see the same here in this photograph. The building by Dennis Lasden could have been built this year. Well, if there was no pandemic, maybe even with the pandemic. But the cars are obviously from the 50s, if not 40s. Yeah. Now, this is a more recent picture. Uh, the building is still, you know, uh, atemporal almost in its, um, you know, luminous uh, modernity. No, truly, if this building was built in 2020 or 2021 or 2022, it would have looked quite okay in that year or this year. Interesting also uh, certain things here, you know, that uh, more conventional architects wouldn't do. If you look at this, the proximity of uh, and the angle between these two, uh, you know, prisms, you know, uh, one uh, more inclined towards criticism would uh, comment on, uh, you know, uh, but uh, you can't. I, uh, are these balconies? Maybe they are rather narrow, they seem, or maybe as narrow as this. Anyway, from this balcony, you can look into this apartment. And uh, from this apartment, you could also look into this apartment. But, uh, you know, this is frequent in, uh, you know, many cities of the world. You know, I remember in Venice, I spent a few uh, nights in someone's apartment who invited me there. And, uh, you know, when I opened the, the oblongs, you know, I saw the, the, you know, across the street was just two or three meters away from where I was. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, such situations are not uh, truly uh, uncommon at all. Anyway, no, I'm mentioning this because some people make a big uh, case of uh, this, you know, that uh, I, I, you know, the life has all kinds of, uh, uh, you know, uh, difficult moments or uh, difficult circumstances. So why not add another one? No, I'm not trying to be cynical. I'm just uh, trying to understand, uh, uh, you know, Dennis Luster. Now let's hope we have the plan here too. But it's an it's an architecture with with vigor. It has vigor, and uh, architecture needs vigor. You know, unless it wants to advocate uh, lack of vigor, which which is a, a, an alternative too. But uh, 
I still think sculpturalness is important for architecture because because of that sculptural sculpturalness you have you know the 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 dialectics between shadow and light um, which are important for architecture and Le Corbusier was one of the most famous ones to uh, derive even a definition of architecture from that It's a good building. It's a good building and surprisingly uh, fresh, I would say. Dennis Lasden, Sir Dennis Lasden. And now we, we can look at the plan. So the, what I see here is uh, the access to the apartments through an, from an exterior corridor, which I always advocated and admire. Something that is not done in Romania and I don't understand why, because it's so easy to, to uh, you know, uh, create uh, comfortable apartments with double ventilation, cross ventilation, uh and to access it's uh, it's it's extremely easy it's not done in, in our country and the reason i was told is because of our climate what climate great britain doesn't have a more tough climate than romania that's for sure and uh, you can see this kind of um, arrangement in uh, scandinavian countries everywhere so how come uh, you know we 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 think that this is not possible here it's it's, it's simply not so but uh, we prefer to to you know uh, expel the staircase somewhere inside the block of flats you know often uh, without enough ventilation or natural light in a stiff space where neighbors do not like to meet and exchange ideas or smoke a cigarette and so on while here is so very possible you have the private balcony, but you also have the collective, uh, well, the corridor from which you access the apartments, uh, which belongs to, to everybody. Uh, and uh, truly, uh, this, uh, this way of conceiving uh, blocks of flats uh, 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 creates a lot of possibilities. To, uh, truly, you can, um, you know, model uh, very interesting uh, you know, uh, configurations. Uh, the building has uh, levels of sophistication, e even what we look at here. I don't know if this was not modified. Uh, maybe it was not, you know, uh, interesting to have an opaque uh, door incorporated uh, into a vast uh, glass surface. Rather unusual. Dennis Lasten, Sir Dennis Lasten. You see this, this uh, you know, uh, oblique dialogue between two apartments uh, certain people might protest against, but I think, and I don't think it's a perversion. I think uh, it's an allusion uh, to certain fruitful discomforts that life has. And maybe these fruitful discomforts should be, uh, you know, looked upon with seriousness. I'm even thinking to make a presentation about architecture and fruitful discomforts. Because, because not all discomforts are uh, without some, uh, uh, at least uh, prospective, uh, positive outcome. The apartments are just fine, luminous. Um, what can we say? It's clear here is a, was a knowledgeable architect who uh, created this block of flats careful to, to every detail, and certainly not brutalist. This is not a brutalist bill, no. Now, a house from 1957, Salkin House, Bethnal Green, East, East London. Well, a house, 
this I noticed, and it it uh, it, um, it uh, imbalanced me <laughs> linguistically because uh, also I showed the other day that so-called house in um, in Japan by Kazuyo Sejima by Sana, which appeared to be more than just one house, just like here. So I guess it's the generic name for a, even for a, a block of flats for an apartment building house. Here again, we are dealing with uh, the same, uh, you know, access into apartments from uh, an exterior corridor. Nice. I'm all for it. The more, the more we will do this, the better. Look how well, look how well, you know, it's how easy it is to, to, to create a, a functional and comfortable apartment because of this um, double orientation. I have the experience of such uh, buildings in Sibiu. There are such buildings. Uh, in fact, I, I even grew up in one of them. It's okay. I know now people would protest that, wait a minute, if I want to arrive at this door, I have to walk up on this uh, exterior corridor and I pass by the window of the kitchen of this neighbor. So what? You might say hello to each other. What's so bad? And okay, if you are not in good terms with each other, you simply lower your head and you keep cooking. It's okay, it's fine. I think this kind of uh, architecture for blocks of flats is much better than to have to enclose the vertical circulation into a, somewhere in the middle of the, of the, of the building. No, uh, I mean, at the interior of the building. Plus this kind of sculpture, sculpturalness, you cannot arrive at easily if you, if you do that. But like this, you can have practically a very large uh, 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 repertoire of possibilities. And you see the building uh, is, has distinction as opposed to the buildings that we see here, here and here. I mean, I only see a fragment. But this is architecture, and is architecture exactly because of this uh, uh, intermediate uh, part of the of, of the building? This uh, you know, which, which consists of circulations. Uh, the, the monumentality, the sculpturalness of the tower with the with the with the elevator, and then the connections, and it's so it's so easy to comprehend the functioning of the building. I think it's very nice. Again, bravo to the Sir Dennis Luster. Nothing extravagant, but this is, uh, you know, high quality architecture for a program where, you know, uh, people don't uh, innovate so much, actually. And can you imagine this was done 70 years ago, almost 70 years ago. It doesn't look like it. Well, it's well kept, it's true, but uh, you can tell this is quality architecture. Well, there is a, re a reason why he was ignited, no, and it became a sir, is because of the quality of his work. That's why. Uh, you see a book published, uh, th 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 there was a few years ago, maybe still is, massive, expressive sculpture, brutalism, now and then. In Vienna, I saw a book uh, published in German, Brutalismus Now. 
Yeah, you see here the top, uh, the church that I showed the other day by uh, Fritz Wotruba in Vienna. The Beauty of Brutalism, Raw Concrete, another book published by, uh, uh, you know, on, on this subject. Now here we see this word, raw, which is actually reading from uh, left to right, uh, well, from right to left, the word war. Raw is something that uh, Zaha Hadid herself wanted to arrive at. In an interview, she said, I want to create an architecture which is raw, earthy, and vital. Well, out of the three of this triad, in my opinion, she perhaps achieved sometimes a certain vitality, but certainly not rawness and not earthiness. Uh, well, unless you consider some works, some, some maybe the earlier works in concrete with a certain level of rawness, but uh, to have earthiness and rawness, this in my opinion, Zaha Hadid didn't arrive at. Maybe she, if she lived longer, she would have. This brutal world, this is a, a structure erected where else, but in China by Herzog and de Moron. I always like this. It's also reddish. Well, the picture here is in black and white. This brutal world, in my opinion, is not brutal at all. To me, what is brutal is mediocrity. Something that is, uh, you know, honestly uh, vigorous, uh, with a, even with an appearance of uh, what we might call uh, uh, brutality, in my opinion, maybe I'm subjective, uh, is not brutal. No, it's like saying, uh, the, you know, truth is brutal. Truth is truth, even when it is not gentle. Uh, I think we should appreciate it and be affectionate towards it, even if you know, it's, uh, you know, not sweet enough for certain sensibilities. Like uh, I mentioned that work by Herzog de Moreau, and I hope I, sh I show here some pictures with it. I didn't look at this presentation for, uh, for a while. I like this work. Um, yeah, this is what it is in a former communist country. Look what they built and what they built. And look at the people, you know, we complain in our country that we are not uh, sophisticated enough, we don't have enough knowledge, we don't this and don't, we don't that. Well, what about the builders here? You can tell them with very primitive tools, they are working on a, on, on a work which belongs to what we might call the avant-garde, coming from the West. So there is no contradiction actually between the two. Now, of course, here there was, uh, in, you know, uh, implicated uh, I have a way and, uh, you know, uh, but, but uh, what is to be underlined is the fact that China, a former stringently intense communist country, now is a laboratory of uh, almost anything goes. That is also bad from certain points of view, but it's also good from, an, uh, from other points of view that architects like Herzog and de Moron find a way to explore certain architectures. And we look at uh, one of these things here. You know, maybe, maybe just these two people built this thing. I don't know. I only see these two people now. But I, I, I like this picture, that here is a manifesto of, uh, you know, some kind of uh, turbulence, uh, Western turbulence uh, landing in China. And just two people in uh, curious, uh, you know, postures in the proximity of the building, uh, no one else around. Very interesting. But I, I like, I like this building. And if this building is brutalismus, well, let's say welcome brutalismus. Well, we see also architecture students, or I don't know, other kind of kinds of people. Um, we even see someone there risking his life. Of course, the pedantic one would claim, well, where are the, where is the railing? You know, this person might fall. Well, yes, this person might fall in many places in life, you know. Uh, whose responsibility is it? Well, 
it's becoming popular, the building, as you can see, former communists, you know, born under Mao, some of them. Now you look at this person here, you know, it's clear that this is rather difficult. There are no steps here, you know, it's not really a step. And yet, why, I, you could understand why the child is doing this, because he's a child. He doesn't have the, you know, the, the inhibitions of the adult. But what is the adult doing it? Maybe the adult is doing it to save the, the child. Maybe, but maybe not. Maybe the adult is also carried away by juvenile uh, impulses and enjoying the adventure of walking uh, uncomfortably on this uh, uh, sloping uh, plane of concrete. It's possible, but you see, Yesterday I tried and I guess I didn't find the right words and I wasn't very inspired and I apologize, but I, I kind of alluded to this. You build a structure without a function. You just build it. And in a way, the crazier, the better. You just build it and then let people discover it, use it, employ it, enjoy it. This is what we look at here. These people, just like the pioneers who enter a forest which was never explored before and they like to, to go exactly to those more uncomfortable places, here the same thing, people, people are curious, you know, they enter this thing, they don't know what to expect, but they love to discover. Why is it that this conception about architecture is not employed more often? I think it would be to the benefit of anyone because it stirs up your curiosity, because you don't know what it is. You don't know what its function is. It's not a prescriptive building. It's an explorative building. It's a, it's a building, an enigma in a way. And you enter the enigma and you, in a way you generate meaning through your presence inside of this building. Yeah, uh, so I can only agree with so Fujimoto when he said uh, he formulated the space of his creations into that, uh, you know, ambiguous, conflictual, mysterious space between function and no function. You know, uh, the so-called no function could receive a function in the process of being inhabited or used. And these are, you know, this is a diagrammatic drawing of, uh, of that structure. And here is the, the building by, uh, not by Sir Dennis Lasden, by, by Sir, well, he's not a Sir Herzog, uh, Herzog and de Moron, the famous uh, Swiss um, architects. By the way of brutalismus, no, it's, it's it's, uh, it's 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 a very nice uh, brutalism, if if you ask me. The more of it, the better, in my opinion. Okay, you see SOS brutalism, but a global service. This is the the, the English, uh, uh, you know, uh, publication. The, the, the German one is, uh, you know, barely seen on the left. And yes, it was called SOS Brutalismus. You know what SOS means, you know, it's, uh, uh, it means danger. That's what it means. But I think Friedrich Nietzsche would have loved it because he said very clearly, live dangerously. That's something we don't do. I don't do it either. That's the truth. I'm a coward. I'm a bourgeois locked up in a room. I'm even afraid to get out, afraid of the virus, the almost dead virus. Now let's go back to Dennis Lasden, the Fitzwilliam College from Cambridge, in Cambridge, 1959-1963. So approximately 60 years ago, it was built this. Uh, sorry about the resolution of, this, uh, of these pictures. Uh, 
a lot of glass. But uh, otherwise, uh, you know, the, the buildings seem to uh, have that very clear conception that we saw, um, you know, uh, in, in the previous buildings that we looked at by him. Oxford, an old university which is not uh, afraid to assume also levels of modernity and ca it continues to do so. And you see in, in this case also the, the importance of the exterior spaces, corridors, you know, uh, all kinds of pass passages, uh, and, and just like in, in his apartment buildings. This, this establishes a dialogue with the exterior, which is important. It doesn't matter, it rains or it doesn't rain. The Royal College of Physicians in London, Of course, when you have an old statue like, like here, in the proximity of a, of a new building, you know, expressing modernity, I think the, the dialectics between the two are always enticing. And then, if you have also a magnificent tree like uh, here as well, all for the better. So we have art, we have nature, we have architecture together and some old uh, you know furnishings for the uh, for the environment you know the, the the poles for the for the you know lighting system of the streets which have some character because they belong to uh, you know to a different time but they are kept well so right in this picture, we see se several layers of um, physical reality. I think this is nice when, when, when you can see several of them simultaneously. So the College of Physicians, Sir Dennis Lasden, not employing not only horizontal windows, but also vertical, narrow windows, as you can see. It's good to break any dogma. So uh, the dogma of the, of the horizontal uh, window should be at least sometimes uh, severely questioned. The interior is just like the exterior. And here again, we see what uh, England is good at to bring in tradition as well, you know, at least through these uh, paintings, maybe the founders of the college or professors here in I don't know what century, but uh, it looks good, you know, and an old uh, painting on the wall of a definitely modern uh, interior. Dennis Lasden, Sir Dennis Lasden. Now, 
Now the core buildings of the University of East Anglia, Norwich, 1962-1968, uh, kind of similar with what we saw earlier. In fact, so similar that I, I'm a little bit confused. Even when I prepared the presentation, I was uh, I was confused. I didn't know was uh, was that uh, campus in uh, in Oxford or is this one is in Norway? They 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 look uh, very similar, if not identical. Maybe maybe he liked the scheme so much that he felt contempt to you know uh, compelled to to repeat it. Except that here the concrete is not so well kept, at least in this picture. What bothers me is when when we have so many so much so many windows so much glass and the windows don't open uh, to me is uh, to say the least a little unsatisfying otherwise you know these exterior passageways and corridors create that uh, democracy of movement and uh, you know the possible dialogue uh, which I think is important to life. And it's important to education too, because this is an educational setting and students are supposed to communicate, to dialogue, to exchange ideas and so on. And, and these uh, exterior spaces are conducive to this. I don't know about those manicured uh, trees, you know, uh, they are not really in the tradition of uh, the romantic uh, British uh, landscaping. I understand these are planted on, uh, you know, in those cubicles, but um, they are a little bit burlesque, in my opinion. Uh, maybe it's not him, him who was responsible for this or is responsible for it. But the, the, the articulation, the sculptural articulation of the volumes and so on is, uh, uh, you know, done convincingly and clearly. Again, look at the cars and look at the buildings. This is an old picture. So it's from, I don't know, 60 years ago or so. The cars changed too, but the buildings, if you be like this today, it would be just fine. So the Charles Wilson building at the University of Leicester. Um, what uh, is, I don't know what, uh, University of Leicester. There were some remarkable buildings built in Great Britain. Uh, James Sterling also built uh, significantly, but this is also a good building, I would say, in this modernistic, uh, Know, approach to, uh, uh, to architecture. It's almost when, when you look at, the, at these works by Sir Dennis Lasden, you almost feel tempted like saying, it's not so difficult to do good architecture. Because somehow his, uh, his buildings uh, uh, emanate uh, this feeling that, uh, you know, with a clear conception, you know, a little bit of courage and a little bit of skill, you can do a good building. It's, it's, it's almost luminous in its clarity. 
you know, feel here, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, struggles and uh, ambivalences and doubts. And uh, no, no, it's, it's a clear conception and it was approved and it was built. And the students enjoy being outside of the building on the beautiful grass on a sunny day. I have to come back to this fact that this gentleman studied at the Architectural Association. I suggest to everyone, including to myself, to look again or look for the first time, but look at the, at the page on the web of the Architectural Association at the very bottom, you'll see the list with the alumni, the people who studied there and graduated from Architectural Association is an unbelievable, it is an, a most unbelievable list. I would say even now, at least 80% out of 100, of course, that uh, moved the, the world of architecture, went through that school. And the question is why? What was so magical about the Architectural Association? And perhaps it still is. It's, it's non-conformism, it's, it's serious, non-conformism. From what I know, at the time when uh, Rem Kolhas and Zaha Hadid were studying there, uh, you know, there, was, uh, there, was, there wasn't even a curriculum. It, it, it was, uh, you know, it, it, it was almost an ad hoc school, a spontaneous school. Um, and its results were and are remarkable. They had three Pritzker Prizes with graduates from Architectural Association, two or three Sterling Prizes, which are the, the, the biggest prizes in architecture in Great Britain, and other, other kinds of prizes. You know, everybody went through Architectural Association, even Stephen Hall for a while, even Herbert Michon, the former critic of the New York Times. Hey, it was a magical place and it still is a magical place. And why is it that the other schools of architecture don't learn from the Architectural Association? Most of them. The Institute of Advanced Legal Studies, Institute of Education and the Library of the School of Oriental and African Studies in Bloomsbury. Here it is, a building which is, doesn't express uh, you know, significant modesty, but uh, it does have a level of uh, vigor that is uh, to be noticed. It's an institutional building. Yes, it's, it's, it's obvious. Uh, it, it, it does have power, uh, you know, physical power. Uh, I like these things at the top. I don't know what's going on there, but uh, they, they make the show, so to speak. Otherwise, this thing is, you know, we had seen such things. It's not uh, the first time we saw this kind of architecture, but it's interesting what's there at the top. You know, the solid above the void, if by transparency we mean the void. So we have three registers, concrete, glass, concrete. Maybe a little bit too clear, but uh, I guess it works. Although it is a little bit intimidating, but you know, maybe that that is not necessarily bad for a, such a fragile uh, field like uh, education. Although maybe it's not so fragile any longer since it became an industry itself, like everything else. Music is an industry, film is an industry, education is an industry. Sir Dennis Lasdan, Bloomsbury. 
now we arrive at probably his best known work the royal national theater in london on the south bank 1967-1976 here it is now when he built this building these yellow parts were not yellow and all these uh, you know illustrations here or here I guess uh, at least at some point, some people wanted to bring in some so-called joy. I don't think it need. I think it's a good building. Uh, it could have been left at peace, you know, without, uh, you know, uh, stickers on it. You know, like this, in particularly this corner is, is quite interesting. I hope I have a detailed pictures of it. picture of it. It's rather dramatic. Um, this is a favorite view from, from this corner, you know, the National Theatre in, 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 in London. Even this work, in my opinion, is not, it's not really brutalist. Yes, it has concrete, but uh, strangely, maybe very few people call Tadawandos brutalist, but I don't think Tadawandos uh, concrete is um, you know less uh, you know, vigorous let's put it this way than uh, this one and thus less uh, less brutal now even this building i wouldn't i wouldn't really call it brutalist maybe it has some touches of maybe excessive uh, you know confidence in concrete but uh, we have we have seen buildings even more uh, abrupt in this kind of aesthetics. I like this corner here, you know, it's it's almost religious somehow. And uh, unfortunately, the, the photo photographer, in my opinion, could have done a better job. Uh, or maybe I eyes because I like symmetry sometimes and here is, um, you know, disturbed symmetry. But uh, you, you get a feeling that uh, it is rather impressive, this, uh, this corner of the building. And it's not the only part. It's a large building, of course. We are talking about the National Theatre of, of, of London, in London. So it's, uh, you know, look at it. You know, it's, it's, it's a very large building. I'm afraid to, to leave the, the concrete exposed also in the interior. Yes, there are comfortable sittings, uh, 
uh, there is carpet, but uh, the you know the the concrete is itself without any kind of veil or masking, and that's good, I think. Although the bourgeois might protest, but uh, the bourgeois had the experiences even more, uh, uh, you know, uh, provocative from other architects and artists. So I'm sure the bourgeois can uh, can handle it. This, uh, the red one is a new building. Uh, it was built a few years ago, and uh, I will end this presentation on Sir Dennis Lasden with it. It was not built by, uh, by uh, I almost said Sir Bernard Chumi, by Bernard Chumi, um, who also went through Architectural Association himself, uh, who also wrote a book, uh, Red is Not a Color, and who loves redness. I love redness too, it's the, it's the color of uh, passion, the color of love, and the color of the left, ideologically speaking. Uh, is the color of revolution. Uh, what exactly symbolizes here, I don't know. But this is still the building by Dennis Lasden, Sir Dennis Lasden. And uh, the name of the architect who did this, uh, the red shed that we looked at, and we are going to see a few more other pictures, is this one, Howard Tompkins. Uh, the shed in London, you see it in the proximity of the of the building by uh, Sir uh, Dennis Lasden. Even a more modest building, if it has uh, the courage of uh, certain chromatic choices, a certain resoluteness in terms of uh, you know appearance and constitution, is fine. I think it's a good addition and a good contrast to the building by uh, Dennis Lasden. Here in the, in the distance is the Cathedral uh, uh, St. Paul by uh, Sir Christopher Wren, another sir who was not an architect but who peeled a lot and by some is considered the most important uh, British architect ever, although there is competition now uh, from uh, other sirs who, uh, you know, uh, 
would like to debate that choice, but Sir Christopher Wren, who never studied architecture, but who did build a lot, um, build the largest uh, cathedral in London, St. Paul Cathedral. And across the street, Jean Nouvel built a, a super mall, a, a big building, a mall, which does pay homage to St. Paul's Cathedral in its own uh, interesting and specific way. So there is a dialogue here between buildings. There is a certain uh, explicit or less explicit uh, contextualism. And Jean Nouvel was and is, uh, is uh, French, sometimes subtle uh, way, uh, contextualist. But contest, context can be um, uh, honored also through contrast, like harmony through contrast. It's possible, like we have here. Okay, so uh, that was it for today.